Thank you, Gunter. Today, our guest in the Water Resources Podcast is Gunter Blaschel, who is a professor at the Vienna University of Technology in Austria. And uh, Gunter is a very globally renowned hydrologist uh, and has worked a lot on flooding issues. He has received numerous awards during his career and was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering in 2020 uh, for international leadership in prediction and management of extreme hydrological events. Thank you so much, Gunter, for joining me today. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you. So, Gunter, I think it would be nice to begin the conversation. We will cover a lot of things today in this podcast, uh, but uh, covering both the, the causes of flooding at regional to global scales. And you have done a lot of work in Europe, uh, but also globally. And uh, then looking at um, with a deeper understanding of the causes of flooding, then we can develop better solutions, considering both nature based solutions and engineering solutions. And uh, I like your work also on social hydrologic aspects. Uh, so looking forward to, to covering those different issues. But maybe we can just first start with uh, recent flooding in Bologna, in Italy in May this year, and also flooding in Germany in uh, summer of 2021, um, uh, with almost 200 fatalities in, in Germany. Maybe you can describe a little bit about uh, those floods and your understanding of them. Yeah, there have been a number of major floods in Europe in the last years. One of the outstanding ones is the, the flood in Germany two years ago, which uh, more than 200 people killed, as you said. This event was very unexpected. It was not so much unexpected in hindsight, but at the time, the event started, there were forecasts, but then for a number of reasons, the flood was not managed in an ideal way. And uh, as a consequence, there were uh, so many fatalities. And also the event in uh, Bologna was similar in that uh, even though there were fewer fatalities, it was unexpected because there was a very similar event only half a year before. There was a very similar event in September, October uh, 2022 in Emilia Romana. And now, only a month ago, an almost similar event with a huge amount of damage. So events that appear to be quite unusual, but they seem to happen all the time. Right, right. And of course, uh, we're no stranger to floods in, in, in the US either. And uh, uh, this year, uh, atmospheric rivers in California uh, resulted in uh, widespread flooding in, in that region um, beginning in December uh, uh, 22 and then uh, extending into January 23. And at first, it, there was, uh, it was uh, because it ended a major drought that had lasted for a few years, uh, it was welcomed. Uh, but then as we had a sequence of atmospheric rivers uh, coming, a family of them, uh, then it ended up causing some flooding issues and uh, concerns about that. Uh, so with the atmospheric rivers, you mentioned, you know, the unexpected nature of the floods in uh, Germany and in uh, Bologna in Italy. With the atmospheric rivers, they can see them coming across the Pacific. And so they really have a good uh, forecast a week out. And so uh, in mid-December, then they were uh, tweeting and uh, reporting on projected uh, uh, issues in uh, around Christmas time. So uh, that gives them a good uh, at least a seven day lead time. Uh, but it's uh, difficult to, to manage without uh, that. Um, I guess maybe we saw similar issues in, in Australia in 2011 after the long-term, the millennium drought in, in Brisbane, uh, Toowoomba with about 20 fatalities uh, from flooding in that region. And they had been going through a drought for uh, you know more than 10 years and uh, then the flooding. So that, that psychology is uh, difficult to manage also, right, for water managers. Yeah, these situations all put flood management in a difficult situation for different reasons. In, for the flood in Germany two years ago, it was a flood that was much bigger than they expected. 
And also there were issues with the communication and there were issues with the flood hazard maps uh, that in hindsight uh, were not perfect. In Bologna, the unexpected thing was the quick reoccurrence of uh, two similar big floods then uh, in, uh, in the case of the Brisbane flood in early 2011, it was the unusual thing, a flood immediately following a drought. And there was this additional complication that flood managers really were uh, keeping that the reservoirs full because they were concerned about uh, an, an uh, even strengthening drought in the future. But this was a reservoir with uh, multiple purposes. On the one hand, a reservoir, the purpose of the reservoir was uh, to uh, take up the flood waters. So you want the reservoir to be empty at the beginning of the flood. On the other hand, another purpose of this same reservoir was water supply in cases of um, water scarcity. And then uh, because they kept the reservoir full, they were in the worst possible situation at the beginning of the flood, triggered by the psychology of the concern uh, for a drought. So they're all difficult situations for flood managers to deal with. Right, right. The last thing you want to do after going through a 10-year drought is, uh, you know, to release water. And then people say, oh, my, why didn't you keep that water? Uh, because we're still in a drought. But that ended the drought. And uh, I think uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is becoming more aware of these issues and trying to uh, look at forecast-informed reservoir operations in the U.S., uh, and so they can uh, consider, you know, what the projected uh, climate is and then manage, uh, try to manage the, optimally manage the reservoirs. Um, yeah, forecasting systems exist. And these forecasts are more accurate for larger river basins and for shorter lead times. The smaller the reservoirs, the smaller the catchments, the harder it is. And the longer the lead times, it harder it is, the harder it is. Right, right. So, uh, Gunter, we hear a lot these days about um, climate change, increasing temperatures, um, and uh, the increasing water vapor holding capacity of the atmosphere uh, and causing pre rising precipitation intensity and increasing flood risk. Um, can you describe, because that's just considered like uh, uh, gospel now, <laughs> and uh, maybe that's not equally applicable everywhere, and maybe you can describe more detail on that. Yeah, when we talk about flood estimation or flood forecasting, there are really two main types of forecasts or predictions that are done in hydrology as needed for flood management. The first one was the one we referred to in the case of the, the Brisbane flood or the atmospheric rivers. It is flood forecasts with a lead time of a couple of days or weeks, where we know for a particular time and date, a probable flood discharge water level. This is one basic application of um, engineering hydrology as used in flood management. The other um, application is a little different. It's flood risk estimation or flood hazard estimation, where we are not interested in the exact time the flood occurs. We are only interested in the probability of a given flood discharge or a, a given flood uh, water level. And this is not used for emergency management evacuation as the first type, but that's more used for planning, for design of infrastructure and for flood risk planning for insurance. So these are the two main tasks in engineering hydrology regarding flood, um, flood estimation. Now for the second type, the flood probability estimation, the concern is given climate change, the flood of the given probabilities will increase. And what are the possible reasons? And of course, rainfall is the main driver for extreme floods and uh, uh, there, there is a physical law called clausius clapeyron relationship, which states that as the atmosphere warms up, the water holding capacity of the atmosphere increases. Um, precisely one uh, degree of warming uh, would translate into an extra water holding capacity of 
you could argue now the atmosphere is warmer than it was 30 years ago on average uh, of the northern hemisphere. Now the air temperature is uh, 1.5 degrees higher than it was 40 years ago. And uh, so you could say higher water hauling capacity and therefore the potential for large rainstorms uh, should be increased by 7%, 10% and, and even more. Now, uh, this is true, uh, but this is only one of the effects of a changed climate. It's the thermodynamic effect. But there is also another effect which has to do with change, which is changed atmospheric circulation. And the changed atmospheric circulation means the flow patterns, the storm tracks have changed because of differential heating. The North Pole region is heating more than the equator, and therefore the storm tracks are sh shifting, or perhaps moving more slowly. This is the more dynamic effect. Now, we know that both effects are relevant, but when we actually look at changes of floods on the basis of flood observations, discharge observations on the ground, we see that in many parts of the world, the floods do not increase. And why is that? Even though the temperature, they increase everywhere, the floods do not increase everywhere. And, and the reason for that is the atmosphere is not only saturated. So it is true that Klaus and Caperon applies, but it is not always relevant because the, the atmosphere is not always saturated. And also, this is only the rainfall side and floods are not equal to rainfall. The rainfall translates into runoff, modulated by soil moisture, evaporation, snow, and, and uh, runoff routing, and, and lots of other processes. So the, um, the summary of these changes, of the climate change, is that, yes, warmer temperatures translate into larger water holding capacity, but this is not always relevant, only in, in some regions of the world. So some of your work, um, Gunter, you talk about um, that we're the, Europe is currently in a flood-rich period, and you, you looked at these uh, periods over the past 500 years. That was a very interesting analysis. And, uh, you know, considering when in the past we've had these flood-rich periods and how the current flood-rich periods compares with those. Yeah, we did an analysis on the basis of historic archival data on many places across Europe of the past 500 years. There are uh, analyses of written records, so text records, where we get information about the magnitude of floods. And we analyzed that, published in Nature uh, two years ago. And what we find, as you said, the last 10, 20 years were flood rich as compared to the context of the last 500 years. But this is not the only flood-rich period in Europe. There were lots of other flood-rich period, periods. The, the most prominent one was in the Little Ice Age in the, around the 17th, 18th, 18th century. And it was a period where floods were even bigger and even longer and more widespread uh, than they are now. And the interesting thing which also relates to the question of Clausius Clapeyron is that in the past, there's, there was quite a clear correlation between the air temperature during, the, during a, a decade, a given period, and the propensity for flooding. The flood-rich periods in the past in Europe were significantly cooler than the flood poor periods. So, which means, yes, Clausius Clapeyron applies, but the other processes that come in, and in the past, the colder periods were the periods with, uh, with more rainstorms and with bigger flooding. The last 20 years are an exception because they are much warmer than essentially all the periods in the past because of climate warning. And so the, the mechanisms have changed. We have a warmer climate, and notwithstanding a trend that deviates from the past and more floods because other mechanisms kick in, uh, such as changed storm tracks, which we can observe. Uh, I really uh, commend you on uh, pulling together such a long record and trying to put the current uh, issues uh, within a long-term context. 
because that's often what we lack. And, and it's really important, I think, to contextualize uh, the current situation. Uh, you have done some excellent work on looking at uh, causes of flooding, and I really enjoyed your paper in Hess, where you examined three different hypotheses uh, related to flood generation mechanisms, land use change, hydraulic structures, and uh, climate change. Maybe you would describe uh, that work for us a little bit, Gunter. I thought it was excellent. Yes, thank you. Uh, when we look at flood changes, that is how the probabilities of a given flood or a discharge of a given probability changes, there's not just climate change, there are also other factors. And the other two main factors for river floods uh, is land use change, that would be urbanization, for example, or more heavy agricultural machinery, uh, or it could be deforestation. So these are the three main land use, land cover changes that would affect flooding and potentially increase the flooding. Now with this, um, these, uh, these, these processes, it is to say that uh, uh, deforestation, for example, mainly affects the small floods. And the effect on the big floods, they are much smaller because the storage capacity through which vegetation mainly operates in attenuating floods, floods is exhausted. So when you plot the flood magnitude against, uh, when you plot the change in flooding against the flood magnitude, you will see for, for small floods, there's a big effect of afforestation, deforestation, and this effect essentially diminishes as the, the flood becomes uh, huge. And the, the corollary, corollary of that is that uh, afforestation, um, planting trees, may be a very good strategy for ecological reasons, and certainly biodiversity has many good uh, positive effects, um, but it will not help in reducing the flood risk of rivers because it mainly operates on the small floods. So this as far as land use change is concerned. Uh, and uh, these effects, afforestation, but also urbanization and um, and agricultural machiners, machineries, they are particularly relevant for the small catchments of a couple of hectares and square kilometers. As they, we go up in catchment scale, we can see from the data that the effects also diminish. For the small catchments, they are relevant. And this has to do with the way runoff is produced, whether the saturation starts from the top of the surface or is a, a result of the rising ground of the table. So that's the, the first aspect of land use change. Then uh, the second um, process that affects changing the floods or changing flood, head, flood hazards, hydraulic structures, um, re river regulation, river training. And um, here the situation really depends on the, on the local conditions. River uh, training, of course, has a high potential of increasing floods because of the loss of the floodplains. So as uh, levees are constructed along the rivers. The river is constrained to its main bed and um, the attenuation of the flood wave by storing water in the floodplains is, is lost, which um, can, uh, can increase the, the magnitude of the floods. But this again does not relate to the largest of the largest floods because the largest floods, they overtop the levees anyway. So, uh, these effects are from immediate and, and moderate um, floods. So this is uh, hydraulic structures. And then uh, the third um, aspect, the third process affecting floods is of course climate change. As mentioned uh, previously for the 500 year study, and we did an, a similar study an analysis of flood changes and the causes of flood changes driven by climate for the last 60 years in Europe. Uh, based on uh, a thousands and thousands of stream flow observations in a, a big collaborative frame, uh, project uh, funded by the European Research Council. And in, in this project, we found that there are very clear patterns of flood changes in Europe based on observations, not by, based on modeling, based on observations. And we see that in North um, Western Europe, floods are increasing. 
in the, this has to do with um, more frequent storms with a, with a shift in the storm tracks. So it's generally Northwestern Europe is becoming wetter. Uh, soil moisture is higher, rainstorms tend to increase and that's why there is a, quite a clear tendency of increasing floods. Then in Eastern Europe, we see a, a trend of decreasing floods very clearly, very strong decreases. And this has to do with a completely different process in this region of the world. Floods are mainly snowmelt floods because of warmer temperatures. Snowpacks are shallower, so snowmelt is less. And then for therefore the potential of the flooding goes down. And also we see a shift of processes. There are fewer snowmelt floods and more rain floods. And on the other hand, in Southern Europe, in the Mediterranean, we see two effects. We see effect for the medium-sized and large catchments for the floods actually to go down, to decrease. And this has to do really with the increased evaporation. Evaporation is changing big time in Europe with the warmer temperatures. For example, in Austria, evaporation in the past 40 years has increased by 17%, 17%, an increase of the, of the evaporation, again, based on measurements, not based on modeling. But this, is an, this is what I tell my students. The amount of water that Austria loses because of the extra evaporation is equivalent to the entire drinking water consumption of the world. That's a huge amount of water that, uh, that's lost to the atmosphere because of the enhanced evaporation. And one of the effects of that is that soil moisture is lower, which reduces the flooding in Southern Europe for medium-sized and large catchments. But the second effect is flash floods, that is floods that are produced by thunderstorms, short durations, short, small spatial extent. And uh, here convective processes, thunderstorms are, are more relevant, and we see increases in these convective events. And the interpretation is this because of the enhanced energy, more energy in the atmosphere, there's more potential for these very intensive storms. And uh, we see the fingerprint of these in enhanced activity of thunderstorms also in flood damages, in particular in small catchments and uh, in the south of Europe, also enhancement of, of landslides that are triggered by these very intense short duration storms. Well, I mean, it's really important to understand these processes and the flood generation mechanisms. Uh, but oftentimes we simply just say um, heavy rainfall flooding, you know, ergo flooding. But it's much more complicated than that. And um, I think uh, your recent uh, paper in Communications, Earth and the Environment, that review in 23, uh, you talk about the shifts in the flood generation processes exacerbate uh, European flooding. Uh, rather than the changes in extreme rainfall. Uh, that was a very nice analysis, uh, looking at rain, dry, rain, wet, rain, snow, and snow melt, uh, and increases and decreases in flood frequency. And I think that's some of what you were uh, referring to in just yes. the previous response. Yes, yes. So there are shifts in the flood mechanisms. For example, in Eastern Europe, more rain floods, fewer snow floods. In Southern Europe, uh, shift towards more flash floods in small catchments. So flooding is not, flo is not flooding. The mechanisms matter because the change mechanisms, they differ depending on what type of flood we are looking at. And I really like that you emphasize the impacts on different catchment sizes and different flood sizes. You know, not a one size fits all. Uh, these uh, generation mechanisms vary with the, the size of the catchment and, and uh, the uh, type of flood. So it's very important to distinguish those things, small local floods, convective storms, uh, climate change may be impacting that, but then uh, larger floods, larger catchments, more storage impacted. Um, and so this understanding is critical if we're going to develop solutions uh, for these uh, for flooding issues. Um, I think your 2017 science paper was uh, very nice in looking at uh, climate change impacts on the timing of floods using that uh, uh, 50 year record of data from 1960 to 2010. Um, 
maybe you can describe that a little bit, you know, with the temperature increases and the changing in timing of flooding. Yes, the, the timing of flooding is an interesting concept. The idea is the following. We look at the largest discharge in any one year and note the date or the day of the within the year of that peak discharge. And we do this for every year. And then we calculate the average date over all of these years of the series of, of the flood occurrence. And what we see when we plot the map, a quite interesting map for Europe, for example, we see uh, the regions where we have winter flooding, such as the, the British Islands or the Mediterranean. We can see um, periods, uh, regions of summer flooding, uh, Central Europe, and then regions of, of spring flooding in, um, in Eastern Europe because of snow melt. And this, this timing index give us, gives us a first insight of the causes of of the floods, that is the processes uh, that uh, that drive drive the floods, such as snow melt, intensive rainstorm, long duration rainstorms, rain on snow, and then we looked at how this this timing indicator, how this has changed over over the de last decades, and uh, this change gives us a fingerprint of climate change effects on flooding, that is directly read from the data, just a very direct data analysis with no modeling, no predictions, but we just look at the data from a, through, through the, the lens of this uh, process indicator. And we see that uh, in the northwestern parts of um, Europe, indeed, the floods are changing because uh, of higher rainfall and which translates into earlier floods. So on the British islands, floods are occurring now a couple of weeks earlier than they used to a couple of decades ago. And um, also earlier floods in Eastern Europe because of snow melt occurs earlier because of warmer temperatures. And we see shifts in, in Southern Europe that has to do with the enhanced um, evaporation. So it's a different way of looking at the flood problem, not just at the flood discharges and the associated probabilities, but a different indicator that sheds more light on the generating processes of the floods, because these are very important if you want to predict future climate-driven or floods uh, uh, changes driven by climate or other mechanisms such as land use change and, and hydraulic structures. Without this process understanding, we are really groping in the dark. We need to see what are the reasons for these floods, which then allows us to predict the reasons for the flood changes and then the magnitude of the flood changes. Well, I really uh, appreciate uh, your data-driven approach. Uh, and I think it's a necessary first step before we can go forward uh, with the modeling and other things. And so it's really nice that you uh, put a lot of emphasis on analyzing the data and long-term historical records to look at trends and put the current situation in the context of the long-term. So um, I know it's a career to collect all these data and to analyze it, but, um, but it's uh, really nice at the end to be able to document and as you say, fingerprint uh, the, and that the timing helps you understand the processes. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, great. Um, so this improved understanding of flood generation mechanisms and the variations across catchment size and flood size and stuff, that helps us then, I guess, uh, develop uh, appropriate solutions uh, to managing uh, floods and uh, Traditionally, we've relied heavily on engineering approaches. And um, then more recently, it seems like there's a lot of emphasis on nature-based solutions like wetlands and other things. But I think your work emphasizes that uh, we need all of the above and uh, a portfolio of solutions to address flooding issues. Maybe you can describe some of that and what is appropriate for different size floods or different catchments or uh, some of those aspects. Yes, uh, one could say there are horses for courses, to use a horse racing expression. 
depending on the local situation, some of the solutions may be more efficient than others. For example, starting with engineering solutions, if we talk about flood risk management in small catchments, that is for small creeks with small catchment areas, then very often uh, building retention basins to holding the flood waters back is a very efficient solution because the volume of the flood waves are small, so it's efficient for a given uh, uh, reservoir size actually to take up a large chunk of the flood waves. Now, as we go up in scale for large rivers, uh, the, the flood volumes, volumes become immense. So for example, for the Danube flood in, uh, in 2013, the volume of the flood hydrograph was uh, 4 billion cubic meters of water. And in, in other river basins, the, the flood volumes are even bigger. So we're talking about billions and billions of cubic meters of water. And then it, it is still possible to build polders, retention basins. But um, for a given capacity of these basins, the uh, reduction in the water levels that are possible for simple mass balance region, reasons become minimum. And then these structures become, are no longer cost effective. So even for large catchments building retention areas, it's, it's still a good thing. But we need to be aware that uh, the actual reductions that can be achieved become smaller and smaller. And this is the main reason that levees are built as an alternative because they do not depend on the, this, on the, on the volume. The only, their efficiency depends on the water level, but not how long the flood wave takes. While the retention basins have to do with the time scale of the flood hydrograph, the levees are not related. They are equally efficient for short and long floods. The only, the efficiency only depends on the water level. So this is the basic difference between retention basins and levees. But then, of course, there is a multitude of, of, of other factors, both structural and non-structural uh, solutions, insurances, uh, evacuation, uh, and uh, flood warnings. Uh, there are also, as you mentioned, uh, green solutions. And these green solutions, they are, have become very popular in the last years, in particular in Europe, where we have now the policy of the Green Deal, we are trillions of euro go into a green economy and a carbon-free economy in, in Europe. And green um, management solutions of floods are part of the overall green deal. So what could be a green solution, a green infrastructure uh, for the case of flood management? There are a couple of them. Um, of course, one could be afforestation, so planting trees, but I have already said this is not an efficient measure for uh, reducing big floods. Alternatives are wetlands. So wetlands has, have the, the extra advantage that they're also very good for other reasons, for ecological reasons, for biodiversity. And uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, the problem with wetlands is that uh, they, the way this, the, or the amount of water they can store the amount of water is usually very small. So the way of assessing the efficiency of these kinds of measures in the first um, instance is, what's the volume of water that can be retained if it's a water retention uh, measure relative to the volume of the flood wave? And then if we say, okay, a, a Danube flood has a volume of 4 billion cubic meters of water, a wetland, can retain 4 million cubic meters of water, uh, then we see immediately this wetland has no effect whatsoever on the water level. And, uh, and the problem is that in most instances, the water that can be retained by wetlands is so small that it has very little effect on big floods. So that's the problem with the wetlands. So again, it can be very useful for other purposes, but for flood retention, they are usually not so useful. They may, co they may contribute to other solutions and they make a contribution, but rarely as a solution itself. Another possibility of green infrastructure would be micro ponds. 
that is small retention basins in the landscape uh, where water can infiltrate. And uh, again, these uh, solutions, they can help, but then we need to look at the total volume that they can actually store of water. And there are also issues with sedimentation that can, it's obviously siltation of these reservoirs that can fill with sediments, and then it may be expensive to maintain them. So yes, there are green infrastructure, but um, green infrastructure is certainly not a silver bullet for solving all the flood management problem they can contribute, but other more traditional flood management measures, including infrastructure, uh, engineering measures, structural measures, and uh, financial measures or emergency measures, they still will play a very important role in the future. Right, so it's really important to, to consider the volumetrics, apparently, you know, and, and sometimes we lose sight of that. Um, you mentioned uh, 4 billion cubic meters of water uh, flooding in the Danube. Uh, and so uh, that's equivalent to four cubic kilometers. And for the American listeners, that's approximately um, four million acre feet <laughs> to translate to units that they may be more familiar with. But that that's a lot of water. Um, and so trying to retain that. Then you mentioned retention ponds, and I presume you, you including reservoirs when you dams and reservoirs when you mentioned the retention ponds. Uh, that's another aspect uh, that you are considering. Um, and the micro ponds, uh, you know, I know when Australia was going through uh, the millennium drought and uh, they had uh, rainfall events and they were wondering why they weren't seeing the impact of those rainfall events in the reservoirs downstream. And some of them were saying, well, maybe it's all these uh, small farm ponds or micro ponds that is, uh, are collecting. So during a drought, uh, that may not be uh, the best thing to have, you know. So uh, it's uh, very difficult to consider managing these various extremes. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, for, for each of these measures, there are pros and cons. So as I said, for the micropons, sediments can be a big issue. Then in the drought case, the micropons have the disadvantage that the evaporation is huge relative to the water volume stored because they are shallow. So maybe fine to have tens, thousands, thousands of thousands of micropons, but then one thing to consider is what is the water loss because of the extra evaporation? Right, right. And I think more and more, we're not just dealing with floods, we're dealing with droughts and floods, as we mentioned earlier, you know, so trying to manage these extremes uh, for water management is, is a difficult issue, challenging, very challenging. We actually, actually conducted a recent study in South America, together with colleagues from uh, Florianopolis, uh, where we looked at the joint occurrence of flood changes and low flow changes, because generally it is said, well, floods are increasing everywhere, droughts are increasing everywhere. Well, the reality is, as I said before, floods are increasing not everywhere. If we look at the global map of flood changes based on observations, we will see that at, uh, in about two thirds of the catchments, or so 60% of the catchments worldwide, floods are increasing. And in the rest, floods are decreasing. So they do not increase everywhere. There is a tendency for more catchments with increasing floods, but certainly not 100%. And the same applies with droughts. There's a tendency for more droughts uh, to occur, but this is certainly not the case everywhere. Some parts of the world are wetting up and the number of droughts is, uh, at the, at the, is decreasing. And um, South America is a study in case. Um, in, in this uh, analysis I, I mentioned, in South America, we looked at trends in floods, trends in low flows, and the, a joint analysis of two things. And what we see, about one third, um, 30%, 40% of South America, we have increasing floods and decreasing low flows, which means stronger, stronger droughts. But in, in other parts of South America, we see that both low flows and flood flows are increasing. Because the catchments got just getting wetter. Everything is getting wetter. The water balance increases. And other parts, for example, on the East Coast, this is a, uh, of South America, which is a agriculturally heavily used 
area with lots of withdrawals of water, actually, for irrigation purposes. Both low flows are going down and floods are going down. So it is not necessarily the case that both floods go up, droughts goes up. There are also other cases and very relevant cases where this is not so. Well, I think it's extremely valuable that you actually look at the data. <laughs> and uh, that's so important. Uh, we had uh, Esteban Jabalgi on the podcast earlier, and he was talking about flooding increasing in Argentina uh, because of uh, I- expansion of agriculture, uh, water ta- groundwater tables rising and, uh, and resulting in floods driven by uh, shallow water tables and stuff. So that was... Uh, very interesting. Um, so uh, you've looked at uh, a lot of aspects of flooding, and uh, I know you've done a lot of detailed work in Austria. I found one paper, but I think it was written in in German, which I couldn't. <laughs> I could read the abstract, but not any further. <laughs> um, where you talk about flood risk management in Austria, and I think you refer to. H-O-R-A, or uh, is that a, maybe you can describe that a little bit, you know, what you are doing in Austria where, you know, to to deal with these things. Uh, Yes, Uh, uh, this is the study you are are referring to is a project um, I concluded a couple of months ago, actually, um, uh, and for the the Austrian Ministry of Agriculture and and Water Management. And uh, In this project, we conducted a flood hazard mapping for the entire country. And this was quite an interesting study from a hydrological perspective because we did the hydrological flood frequency analysis for the entire country, uh, like a spatially consistent analysis of all the flood observations we had for estimating 100-year floods, 500-year floods for the entire uh, nation. And that was used as an input into hydrodynamic modeling. You could say hyper-resolution modeling for the entire country, where we, together with partners from the industry, we applied hydrodynamic models, uh, non-stationary dynamic hydrodynamic models with the spatial resolution for of two meters for a country of almost 100,000 square kilometers. As you can imagine lots of cells, a time resolution of a couple of seconds, and then we simulated uh, floods, flooding scenarios for which we derived uh, dynamic uh, flood hazard zones. And these zones, they are used for risk management. They are used for the insurance industry, but also for decisions regarding um, uh, urban developments. And there, so for, for many purposes, uh, this is the foundation. And it's interesting to say that, that the knowing flood discharges, flowing, knowing flood hazards, knowing flood risk, is, it's, it's a key thing for, for, many, uh, for many ways of managing floods or uh, improving uh, the, uh, the living conditions uh, of people. Uh, but it's, it's also relevant to take a broader view of going beyond a scenario of, say, a 100-year flood and what is the effect on inundation levels of a given probability, the extent and the water depth and the flow velocities. This is what we get by these models. Uh, But it's also, I think, very important, will become even more important in the future to uh, look at it from a broader perspective, uh, from the perspective of the interactions between society and water. And this is the argument which gets us into socio-hydrology. Oh, yeah, I was uh, definitely thinking of that, you know, the social hydrologic aspects, the, the linkage between human behavior and, and, and the flooding and uh, engineering aspects. I mean, talk about the levee effect. You know, if you big, build a levee, people think it's more secure then, and then they start to build uh, maybe you can describe that a little bit, um, Gunter. So the area of socio-hydrology is, is the discipline that deals with the dynamic interactions between people, people and water. So it goes beyond what we've been doing traditionally, just looking at scenarios where we have 
like an increase in rainfall of 10%, we run this rainfall runoff model, and then we look at the actions or vice versa. We look at what people do to water quality, and uh, then uh, we look at the consequences. In, in sociohydrology, we look at the two-way coupling of people and water. And two-way coupling means that people affect the, the, the hydrological cycle. And then in the long term, the hydrological cycle motivates people to do something else or to, um, to change the situation again. So it, it's, a, it's a coupling. You mentioned the levy effect, and that's quite interesting and not at all intuitive what's happening there. If, um, if levees are built along, uh, along a river to protect the floodplain, so a natural response of the local community is to move into this floodplain because uh, the construction of the levees conveys to the population a sense of security. People feel secure. The value of the land goes up, the, the area is um, developed. And then um, the, the counter to effect is that even though the levy is built in order to reduce the flood risk, because the probability of an inundation goes down, the increased assets on the floodplain because of the development increases because the value goes down. It might be a smaller probability, but a much bigger value of assets that is at stake. And then as a consequence of uh, the construction of the levees, the flood risk goes up. And this is an unintended consequence. This is a consequence usually engineers who do the design are not aware of. And I believe strongly that we need to shift our thinking to go beyond one individual engineering measure, but look at the longer term perspective and in interdisciplinary, it's interdisciplinary collaborations with sociologists and lots of scientists from different disciplines, look at this coupling and potential consequences of the engineering measures on people, on the environment in the long term. And the levy effect is only one of many examples where we can see this coupling in water management, where the traditional scenario approach is no longer valid because the scenario approach does not look at the coupling. We need to look at the dynamic effects in floods, but the same applies for droughts effect, drought effects. We have very similar effects in, in the interaction between droughts and people for example, and an effect that's, uh, that's uh, known as the rebound effect, meaning that if you increase the efficiency of irrigation, you hope to save water because you need less water for growing a, a, an amount of, of, of crop. But then in reality, what's happening often is that the more efficient irrigation increases water consumption because it, this conveys a sense of availability of water. So farmers will use more land. And as a result, you, you thought you were saving water, but as, a, as an, unintended, an unintended consequence, actually water consumption goes up. And then many of these feedbacks, I think we need to consider very carefully in the future for strategic development of long-term uh, water development measures. Right. Uh, I totally agree with you. And uh, we had an earlier um, person, Quentin Grafton in, in Australia, talking about the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and a lot of emphasis, $7 billion on precision agriculture. And not only maybe they expanded uh, the irrigated area and the rebound effect, but they also didn't take into account that they were losing the inefficient recharge, recharge they were getting of the aquifers from inefficient surface water irrigation. And yes. uh, so it's uh, really important. Uh, and I think we are recognizing more we need to work more with social scientists. These are not just technical problems, physical data requirements. We need to understand human behavior and uh, the impacts of different uh, aspects in the hydrologic cycle. So I really appreciate the work that you and your colleagues have been doing in social hydrology and, and uh, bring, highlighting uh, those interconnections.
Um, so with all of your work on flooding aspects and trying to understand the causes and, uh, you know, optimal solutions and uh, providing deep insights and, and the data-driven approach, you know, and the long-term records, it's really fantastic. How do you see the future? Are you do you think positively about the future that we will be able to adapt and and manage these things and and learn uh, from these experiences and improve the situation? Or what are your thoughts? This this question is not a technical question; it's more a philosophical question. And uh, personally, I'm very positive. So I I think positive about the future to. You use this simple example, the glass is half full, not half empty, the way I look at it. And um, of course, the future will not be easy, but also the past has not been easy for humankind. Uh, but uh, in the past, people have managed to uh, come to grips with the new challenges. And each century has had, has had heaps of new challenges social challenges, technical challenges, environmental challenges, political challenges. And I'm confident that humankind will also very much be able to come to grips with the future challenges, uh, economic, environmental, uh, but also very much social. Uh, and one of them is, for example, equity. We have not talked so much about equity in flood management, uh, but this is to my mind, a very important issue uh, because it, there is a tendency, like a systemic tendency for the, the weaker parts of society to lose out. And I think we really need to have this on, on the radar that equity is a very important goal, uh, goal to achieve also in, in water management, in flood management, in drought management. And there are many examples where uh, this, um, this goal of equity is achieved to a larger or to a lesser degree. So equity, I think this should be, should be high on the priority list if we think about future water management policies. Right. And I think, you know, the U.S. is grappling with that right now and and they overlay social vulnerability on flood mapping and flood exposure and stuff. Uh, and uh, they have, you know, a 50 billion dollar infrastructure funding for water. And so some of that will go to try to address uh, some of those aspects. Well, I really appreciate your time today, Gunter, and uh, and thoroughly enjoyed reading your papers and trying to understand. There was so much to absorb, and I think you have synthesized some of the key aspects very well today. Uh, so thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you, Bridget, for the interview. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>